So, um, this portion is called uh, History is Personal. And I'm going to give my presentation, but I'm going to ground it in time and place. And um, we're each going to do this activity, and when you give your presentation, um, the presenters, the four presenters will go first, and then everyone else is invited to um, add whatever you know about history in, in or around North Philadelphia, but you must ground it in place and or time. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean in a, in a moment as soon as we, we get all of this. So this map that you're looking at is lacking some anchoring. It's from the Philadelphia Assessment Exhibit that we had. Uh, so this map was enormous on the wall of the Philadelphia building. Uh, I drew in Gerard College and Ridge Avenue and 33rd Street just so that you would have some anchors. But generally, it looks like this. It should be turned kind of long ways like this if you were to do north. Right, so this over here is 33rd Street. There's the reservoir near Smith Playground, the new Discovery Center. This little corner of blue is the Schuylkill River. So DC Gerard College and then Eastern State Penitentiary. This is that <coughs> And then broad would probably be, yeah, broad would probably be this, this long going north and south. So when they had it in the exhibit, they kind of reset or reoriented a lot of the uh, conversations. So just for you to get your orientations, even though you look like that. It's true. Also, and this is, you can find this on uh, philassemble.net. Um, I will send you each a follow-up email that includes the links to um, any source that I bring up. Thank you for that. Um, and then I'm handing out the timeline that went along with that map. I tried to enlarge it as best I could. There's two pieces of the timeline. Oh, yeah. yeah, so there should be a, yeah, there should be like a skinny line and then a big blue one. Yeah. So you should have total three. You should have total three pages. Yep. Yep. Two timelines and then the, in the map. <laughs> I think a little clarity, I'm still not clear on that Philly assembly. On what, you, what about it? I mean, anything about it. So uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia Assemble was a collaborative art project um, that was uh, started by Shana Van Hesbeck, an artist from the Netherlands. She was invited here by the Philadelphia Museum of Art to do an investigative art uh, and social justice project. So she recruited 150 artists and collaborators from around the city. And uh, we did a, we collaborated for two and a half years and it culminated in uh, programs uh, at public sites around the city uh, that all moved in a performative uh, fashion to the Perlman building of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And we held an exhibit there called Philadelphia Assembled um, Communities of Resistance. It was there from September to December, November of 2017. And uh, there are people at this table who were brought together at that at Philadelphia Assemble, and many of us still work collaboratively. Uh, and in fact, we were already working collaboratively before Philadelphia Assemble, which is why we were pulled into the project, because we already did that kind of work. Um, it, is a, it was a massive project, too big to um, explain it all down, <laughs> but there is a website, philassemble.net, and, and that website includes this map. Part of that um, exhibition was a huge city panorama. It was, um, think of it as a, a mural of the map 
of Philadelphia that went the entire length of the corridor of the Pearlman building. And what you have in your hands is a printout of a portion of that map with the graphics removed. Um, so, I hope that's... This, this set of facts was resilience. This historical line right here that we can read. We can't read the other ones. Yes, no, that's but this one that you can read is the resilience line. That's mm -hmm. supposed by those people who participated. Right, on top of... And other timelines. Superimposed on top of the map were timelines, local, national, and international timelines that intersected with personal history, Philadelphia history, and um, both the history of oppression and resistance in the city of Philadelphia. And these, yes. this section, there were five sections, so with the resilience timeline, we look at it's in front of us, which section is in front of us? This is the resilience okay. shots. This is reconstructions which was centered mainly in North Philadelphia. Okay, so we, we, which is why I chose this section of the map. Uh, your, the area that you talk about uh, may be inside or outside of this map. That's fine, just indicate that on the map. But try to draw a connection to North Philadelphia. In other words, in your presentation, you can talk about any person or anywhere in the city as long as you can connect it to one, your own personal history, or the history of North Philadelphia. So are you speaking to everybody or just the representative? Right now, everyone. Um, if, if, uh, if there are stories that lie outside of those parameters, it doesn't mean that we're not, you know, that it's not important and we're not interested in it. We're just trying to narrow this, you know, we can't get too broad or we'll be here until next year. Um, so my whole um, artistic practice uh, involves, it's a process called unforgetting and reconnecting. And I use Philadelphia street maps, monuments, uh, uh, street names, in order to make connections to my own personal history, my ancestral history, and, uh, and Philadelphia history and how Philadelphia history is connected to both national history and international history. So I have an example of my timeline, and you're all going to get to do your own timeline. Um, I, uh, we printed this out, but I have no idea what happened to it. So I'm just going to have to have uh, Okay, so I'm going to pass around mine as a sample and you are going to get some long white strips that look like this and try as best you can to duplicate this when you make your own time. And for instance, um, when I say history is perfect, instead of explaining it, uh, let me just do it, okay, at the same time here. My timeline starts in 1954. Uh, even though I was born in 1959, the events of 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, had a profound impact on my life and the trajectory of my life. Because I was, um, I went to, I ended up going to a high school that was predominantly white, and you know, and being involved in the whole busing and desegregation. So on my timeline, I have my personal events when I was born, when I went to high school, when I had children, when I was married. And on top of that, I put the historical events and uh, historical, significant historical events or e events that impacted me, my family, my community, or it impacted my ancestors and then eventually had an impact on me. And those, now this particular one is not all Philadelphia specific, but since it relates back to me, it's Philadelphia specific. Everybody understand? So our house so, can either be personal or North and or North Philadelphia yes, specific. Yes. So on my timeline is Brown versus Board of Education, and I'm going to pass this around. Emmett Till, 
the lynching of Emmett Till. When I was a little girl, I saw the Jet magazine with the picture of Emmett Till, you know, his, his, um, his battle body. I, that image is seared in my brain. It had a profound impact on me. Little Rock Nine was 1957. 1959, I was born in North Philadelphia. Um, when my mother was pregnant with me, she lived right at the right there at 33rd and Dolphin, right near that the bus depot where the trolley picks some of us up today. There's a house. Is that 33rd in York right there? I'm not. I'm not Dolphin sure. It's like sort a of weird. Bottom. And then York comes. Into yeah, the gas it's station. kind of a, all of New York. Yeah. Susquehanna Dolphin New York. My yes, mother lived right on that corner. Yeah. I think there was an ice cream parlor there, yes. or a cheese place, cat steaks on that yeah. block. Pay steaks. Pay steaks is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What steaks? Paid steaks. Paid yeah. pat steaks was there. There was an ice cream parlor there. Flowers ice cream. Flowers ice cream. Flowers. Flowers ice cream. <laughs> yes. So I actually. Uh, where I was born, well, born in Pennsylvania Hospital, but where I was born, where my mother lived when I was born, is directly, diagonally across the street from these historic mansions. Uh, Strawberry Mansion, Woodford, and Mount Pleasant. And I, I had no, just no clue, no idea. Um, that these houses contained any history whatsoever that was relevant did to me. Did you fantasize about them as a child? I didn't. I wouldn't say I fantasized about them because I didn't know. I didn't know this at the time. But I have felt that I do what I do because I'm being led by you know some spiritual force, including my ancestors. Okay, so next on my list. It, um, uh, 1963. By then, we had moved to Richard Allen Homes or Richard Allen Projects, uh, and 1963 was the Baptist Street Church bombing. Um, 1964, the Columbia Avenue riots. Um, that every time I see the coverage or a write up about the Columbia Avenue riots, I just cringe because even this. This guy did this big special follow-up report 20, 50 years after the Columbia Avenue riot, and all he did was to write the same crappy story that they've been telling for the last 50 years <laughs> about why that, you know, why riot, or I say uprising, why the Columbia Avenue uprising happened. Well, I, I don't know if this is a memory or if my mom just told me about it so many times, but she said that I was crouched down in the back on you know on the floor behind the in the back seat, crouched down, me and her hiding in the middle of the Columbia Avenue uprisings while and my dad was like out there somewhere. Um, uh, Vietnam War, Jawara College desegregation. Um, I graduated from high school after I had my first child. That also had a very profound impact on the trajectory of my life. 1981, uh, and between 1981 and 1985, the move, the bombing, I don't like to call it that, because it sounds like move bombs. Mm -hmm. The bombing of move and Osage Avenue, uh, which is it's something that changed the direction of my life, and it's probably mostly responsible for why I do what I do today, because I'm so outraged about this incident. Um, I was married in 1986, and two more children. After that, I, be, I joined an organization um, uh, for, uh, and I ended up in Hawaii, singing in a chorus of a thousand young women from all over the world. And that's, that's what helps to give me this, you know, this international perspective and to be able to you know, communicate with all kinds of people. Then I met a man named Godfrey Satoli. Godfrey Satoli was a South African exile. And uh, through him, I attended this national con 
Convention for Democratic South Africa, and we used to do um, candlelight visuals around um, the clothespin when the clothespin was still there. And uh, that's how I got involved in the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, fast forward to 1993, Nelson Mandela was released from prison finally, and I was on the welcome committee, and I met Nelson Mandela when he came here to receive the Liberty Medal. Um, and then I ended up in 2004 going to South Africa as a storytelling ambassador with the National Storytelling Network and the People to People Ambassador Program. And that was like a full circle, you know, from the anti-apartheid movement to meeting Mandela. And so this is an old one. I have not updated this yet. But this gives you an idea of what I'm trying to get you to do with your Whatever it is you're researching, whatever it is you're, you're presenting, try to connect it to yourself or your family or your community, personally. Um, so, uh, let's start with three. Let's start with three. If you need more, you can just take more. All right. So, I'll tell you um, one of the first... Um, Stories, and I'm going to base them on location. I'll tell you two stories. Okay. Um, somebody stop me by a quarter after. Okay. And then um, every presenter can have um, five to ten minutes. Okay. okay. All right. So remember, I said I use Philadelphia street names as my um, as my compasses, you know, maps and street names. Well, I realized that many of Philadelphia streets are named after slave owners and or slave traders. When I found in Philadelphia on a list of Middle Passage ports designated by UNESCO, uh, and I found out that there was this organization that intended to, uh, this organization that intended to install historical markers at every one of those um, 51 or so Middle Passage ports on the mainland U.S. There are something like 175 ports, but 51 of them are on the mainland U.S. Or, um, I should be, um, I should not be I'm trying to say that from memory, like I actually have the actual numbers, but Anyway, I saw Philadelphia was on the list, so I contacted this organization. I was like, hey, I'd like to help out with this. And they sent me a letter, thank you very much for volunteering to head up this board this number. And I'm like, why? <laughs> like, that is, you know, so I had to answer the call. I knew that Dr. Charles Bloxham of the, um, the Bloxham Archives and uh, Special Collections uh, was you know, that he was the person that was uh, responsible for getting all of the historical markers having to do with black history in Philadelphia. So I contacted him and, and a few other elders in the community and asked them to be a part of this like, advisory board, right? And I started holding Ancestral Remembrance Day on Penn's Landing every year since 2013. Um, in 2016, the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission approved Dr. Watson's application that he submitted along with letters of support from the community. And uh, a historical marker was unveiled on Penn's Landing uh, in August, August 5th, 2016, acknowledging Pennsylvania's role in the slave trade. Where is that? That is right beside the Independence Seaport Museum at Second and uh, I mean Walnut Columbus Boulevard. I hate even yeah. saying that. <laughs> Columbus Boulevard and uh, Walnut. Uh, it's right outside the Seaport Museum. Um, when I worked at the Philadelphia History Museum, I and this was in. 
thousand nine. I came across an object in their archives. Uh, it was a silver dish, a beautiful silver dish. This dish belonged. It was in the archives because it belonged to a founding family, the Norrises, that Norris Street is named after. There was a story etched in the rim of this beautiful silver dish, and it told the story of a little slave girl who was brought to Philadelphia along with that dish. I looked into it. It is a true story. Um, they were brought to Philadelphia in the aftermath of a hurricane, uh, earthquake in Jamaica, Port Royal, which sank the entirety of Port Royal, Jamaica in 1697. What is it, 1697, I think. And uh, so there were two things that struck me about that. One, my mom grew up at 22nd one in Norris. She grew up on Norris Street. Number two, my great-grandmother was born in Jamaica. And when I researched Isaac Norris, his family had plantations in Port Portland, Jamaica, where my great grandma was born. I'm like, okay, this is too weird. <laughs> so for 10 years, I have been searching for the name of that little girl that was brought to Philadelphia along with that silver dish. Her father died. Uh, in the tsunami that followed that earthquake, trying to rescue Thomas Norris, who also died in that earthquake. Mm -hmm. Thomas Norris also had an estate called Fairhill mm -hmm. at about between 7th and 9th and New York. Mm -hmm. So um, the, that, that estate is no longer there, but um, Okay, so that's that's one location. That's Fairhill, Fairhill Plantation connects to Port Royal, Jamaica, where the earthquake happened, and Portland, Jamaica, where my great grandmother was born. What was the girl's name? And back to North Philly. I never found the little girl's name. Mm -hmm. Every every account that talked about her just called her the slave, the slave girl. I do know that she was raised here. She had a child of her own who was also raised enslaved, but eventually manumitted. I did find her daughter's name. And this just happened maybe a couple of months ago. I was so ecstatic. I was like, I found her daughter's name. I found the little girl's name. What's her name? Her name is Betty. Her name is Betty. Her name is Betty. So most, oh, well, I should even start by St. Louis. That may seem like such a small thing, you know, to, to find someone's name or to, re, to remember somebody's name. But to me, it, it's huge. Mm -hmm. To me, this is huge. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that story. I do have uh, one other one to share with you. That is the story of... Now, right now, I live in the Aoni Ogans area, which, if you look on some maps, it says that's part of North Philadelphia. So I'm... Um, um, You're connecting. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I live there. I live in... A, there's a street near me named Middleton, and there's a park near Ogans, near Broad Aoni, near Central High School, I mean, Philadelphia Girls High named Kimball Park. And this is the diary. As I, you can see, it's like totally uh, worn. This is the diary of Fanny Kimball, Frances Kimball. She was a famous British actress. She was married. Oh, and she was something of an abolitionist. And I'll say that because I think that's what she hoped her book would accomplish. But she didn't publish it until after emancipation. And when you read the language, like the way she talks about enslaved people, <coughs> she didn't have, yeah, it's, it's very derogatory. 
So this, this park near where I live is named for Fanny Kimball. But Fanny Kimball was married to Pierce Butler. Pierce Butler was one of the largest slave owners, the Butler family, uh, in the United States. And in Butler Street, Butler Pike mm -hmm. is named after him. And um, while I was looking into Pierce Butler, looking for my paternal great-great-great-grandfather, because I had heard a rumor, or a story, not a rumor, a story passed down in my family, was that Pierce Butler, uh, I'm sorry, that was that my great-great-great-grandfather was traded from one plantation to, a, to pay off a bet. So I just Googled it just to see, was this a thing? You know, slaves being traded. And what I came across was the weeping time. The weeping time was a, uh, what they call a sale that took place in the, I don't know the date, 18, 1857, thank you. It was uh, one of the largest uh, wholesale sale of slaves all from one estate in one weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, almost 400 people they sold in one weekend to pay off Pierce Butler's gambling debts. And I don't know if you know the story about my third great grandfather came from that. I don't know, uh, but who knows? You know, it, it, it's possible. Um, it just so happened that I, I was telling this story at a performance at St. George's Church, and I met, who was sitting in the audience, um, Pierce Butler's great, great, great niece. Mm -hmm. And she had in her possession what they call the Red Book that her, grand, her great grandmother had put together with the family lineage and all about who the Butlers were and the Langdons and the Middletons. They were all founding fathers. They all signed the founding documents. Not a word in this book about the weeping time and all of the enslaved people that uh, the Butlers owned and sold. So she and I had gallery talk as part of an exhibition at Philadelphia Assembly. So that, that was part of Philadelphia Assembly too. So I would really, I, I don't even know why I'm saying this, but I would really love to see, you know, what we get out of this workshop today. I would like to see an exhibition or something come out of this um, that is not, you know, these kinds of stories, they don't meet the scrutiny of professional historians as being history. But I am claiming the people who were enslaved in these Fairmount Park houses and everything else that, you know, happened to Africans here, I am claiming them as my ancestors. Mm -hmm. Because if, when you have people enslaved on big plantations in the South, it's the, the descendant community, a lot of times, it, they stay in place for centuries. In the north, where people were more spread out and isolated, it is more difficult to, to identify who, their, who the descendant community is. So I am claiming them, and I hope that you, you know, together with me here, here. will claim them as, you know, will, so let's let's claim them and let's mm -hmm. tell these stories. So that's my presentation. I do have like a ton of other stuff over here that you're welcome to look through. Um, you can ask me questions if you like, and then we're going to pass it on to the next presenter. In order to determine which this presenter goes first, please tell us what time period your presentation covers. Uh, they free these people, but they make some connection for them to have some provisions, okay? I'm not going to turn them into some benevolent slave holders, you know, but I just want to talk about how these relationships built over a period of time were interesting, let me say that, just interesting, because 
You have a husband and a wife fighting. You have Bernard to carry the cart and took care of the horses at Mount Pleasant, going back and forth, cart and letters back and forth between the wife and the husband. Maybe even a letter that had them being up for sale, possibly. Then you go to William Coleman, where you have his will here. He wanted the children of the enslaved people to be apprenticed out to learn some kind of a skill, okay? And it's in his will, okay? And then you have Stephen Gerard, which a lot of people think of him as the racist folk who, person who enslaved many, and he did have many slaves. He got them as part of being a businessman from New Orleans, and he kind of just gave them away. But this relationship that he had with Hannah, Hannah, nowhere do I find in all my research, and I've been researching this over five years, nowhere is she cooking or cleaning. Nowhere is Hannah bringing in the ham to the dinner table. She sashaying around so much so that she went to jail two times, and Stephen Gerard was, um, you know, he was a businessman, so he was getting goods from all over. I'm imagining her sashaying around because her daughter was being missioned earlier. I'm considering her possibly sashaying around some silk or something, acting like she was free. Because one of the books uh, that you research talks about her being uh, presumptuous in her older age. <laughs> so, so that kind of tells me she must have been kind of acting free. She was thrown in jail two times, one day, one time for 60 some days, another time for 80 some days. I don't know yet why she went to jail. I just know that Stephen Gerard's brother had to pay for her provisions because back in those days, you had to pay for your provisions when you were in jail. I know other people want to get their thing and so I'll put a pen in it there, but I do have a lot. The, uh, the list of uh, property I think this is the tax assessment, the tax assessment. Uh, 1767 tax assessment for Joseph John McPherson that lists well, it, it uh, for, it for list the list. It doesn't list them by name again. Right. Um, even though we know their names now. So it you know it's important to point out that this is not like Jack um, Judah said, that's not new information. Mm -hmm. You know, these um, historical institutions have had this information in their possession. These um, documents are hundreds of years old. So if anybody cared to know about it, it was there to know. So and on the one hand, I mean, we brought this up at the focus group uh, we had a couple of months ago. Um, on the one hand, we commend the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Fairmont Park Houses for finally talking about this information. But on the other hand, you know, it's a, it's a, a, it's a re reprimand. Yeah. Because why had it changed? Well, why yeah. wasn't it important up until now? Um, so, okay, so next person. So we're gonna try to switch back and forth from a presenter to, um, to a guest. I mean, everybody's a guest, but okay. So anybody else? have anything on their timeline that they would like to share? Anybody down there come up with me? Because everybody has to share something now, so what's on your timeline down here? What's, what's on your timeline? I was born in 1969, and that's when the um, first man went to the moon, that's what I was told. Um, then in 1976, I was in first grade, and that's when Philadelphia celebrated um, their centennial birth. Bicentennial. Bicentennial. Um, rap music was born, and I love rap music, mm -hmm. so we were born around the same time. <laughs> but the internet was also born in 1969 also, so um, those are some historical facts. Um, but I was in a play. I was at St. Francis de Sales in first grade, and I was the little girl that touched Jesus' feet. And everybody got mad at me because I forgot my sandals, and I had to walk on that whole floor uh, with no sandals on. So, like, I got in trouble because I didn't have my sandals on. And I wasn't supposed to be in a play. Like, my mom didn't even know that I was in a play. Like, I was sneaking and going to rehearsals and everything. And in the middle of the play, I told everybody that I was in the play. But I forgot. And that was 1976. 76. 
Yeah. So, what, how do you think that influenced like the what you do today, like the, the person you are today, and the work you do today? Um, forgetting my sandals. Then. Well, <laughs> your, your you know your your experience growing up. Like it doesn't have to be that particular incident, but what? what well, for me, it was yeah. a lot at first. So in 69, the internet was born. Okay. Um, there was the first man to the moon. Okay. And when I was little, I used to think everything was first. Like when I was in the car, I was like, oh, he just made it. She probably knows what she had made it a long time ago. You just was born. Like, it was here before you. So I always thought everything happened. Like, when I first oh, encountered it, you know? <laughs> um, and I think it, okay. it affects me as, um, just somebody who likes to think outside of the box. Uh -huh. I don't have to be the first, but I like to push things um, to the limit and push the challenging conversations. Conversations. So I think that's good. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's totally fascinating. That's awesome. um, okay. to, I mean, I'm, I'm. So everybody that said something so far is is like triggering my own memories. I remember that Green Book. I remember traveling to South Carolina every summer. I remember the car breaking down, but we couldn't get help from anybody and we could only travel. You know, we had to hide at night, so we had to hide the car, like by these railroad tracks under the trees. And I don't know, somebody had a ham, a smoked ham, or my father walked back to Philly. That was a crazy wow. story. So, you know, if I'm, uh, these, um, these white people uh, said, You got a two year old baby with you, and that was me. And, Come on, bring that child in here, and I'll give us some ham. And my aunt was, she had a ham, and she was hiding it. Uh, it was a crazy story. Okay. And um, first grade, I went to Whittier Elementary School. That doesn't even it doesn't even exist anymore. Mm -hmm. I lived at 31st in York. The school was gone, and the moon landing. Mm -hmm. Do you all know that there? This is such, there wasn't such a place in North Philly called Progress Aerospace Agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that now, but I didn't know it before last year when Rashida Phillips said that there was a black aerospace agency in North Philly. The years of Progress Plaza and all that. Yes. yes. It's where Progress Plaza is. Oh, well, that's why it's called that building. I don't know, oh, I didn't know it was in that building, but it was um, started by Leon Sullivan. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is the 50th anniversary of Progress Plaza, and one of the companies he started was a black aerospace agency, and they built like parts for NASA. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jack, what do you want to go next? <laughs> you ready? I mean, how did you find out about the I love the colonial period, but I'm going to bring things a little bit closer to, uh, let's say, to today to a point. I wanted to talk about a woman who I think is an undertold activist story. Her name is Karen Asper Jordan. Anyone know the name? Mm -hmm. Okay. Judith does, but I'm just going to pass around on both sides. Here's a picture of her. And I have some things to hand out, but I just want to talk to her and then try to make a connection uh, with her. Here she is. This picture that you see is what was taken last weekend. She was honored by the Universal Dance Ensemble. For those of you who may not, if you haven't ever seen them, that's a group to see. Um, she was honored as, as, as a hero, as a shiro, and she is indeed that. So with respect to who she is, she became a civil rights activist as a teenager. So we're looking at this. If you can remember, <coughs> I remember it clearly. November 17, 1967. Last year was quite a bit that was done about that. What happened November 17, 1967 was a massive student walkout. About what? About the lack of black teachers and administrators, about the lack of black studies, the wanting to wear dashikis, and the wanting to have black studies become a part of the history of, of within the curriculum of the Philadelphia School District. And Karen was one of those folks. So last year there was a, a, an array of activities. But I went to a couple and I didn't really, I met her a couple times but I never really heard the story. And when she told the story of almost being beaten uh, by the police, and she was saved to a point by a man named Jinzi Trailer, 
who, he said he was 33 years old at the time, and he was at, let's say, the door of the school district, and he just sort of saw what the police officer was going to do. And this is just a picture of what used to be the Philadelphia School District, okay? I'll cast this, I have handouts for you. This is just a picture here. He sort of fell on top of her to save her from having a police baton, you know, almost beat her to death. Now, I just want you to know, tonight around six o'clock, I'm gonna text you. I'm gonna celebrate 50 years out of high school. All right, my 50th of high school reunion because I graduated in 1968. But what happened was still senior year, just that November. Sure. Okay, so June, you, you graduate. So what happened at the high school? What happened at the high school was that I think we were locked in. See, folks know what's going on, but you may not know. I didn't have a clue about anything. I was just out of it. But here you have close to 3,000 students. It started as a quiet protest, and then it sort of mushroomed. I also learned from some research that Catholic school students came out. And I think some of the Hallahan girls may have slipped out too. Huh. But I wasn't there to do that. I didn't even know what was going on. I just remember the roar of like, what is that? Where were you? I was at John W. Hallahan, Catholic Girls High School. I'm sorry, I didn't name the high school. So here you have someone who was active in it. She was about 15, you know, at the time. And uh, she became, as a result of what happened to her, a nurse, all right? And she just retired, I think, about two years ago. For 30 years, she was, for 40 years of nursing, including 30 years of intensive care nursing. Um, it seems as though when St. Luke's Hospital closed its emergency room, Karen Reason, that by the time it took 10 blocks to get to St. Joseph's Hospital, the person could die. So that sort of made her think, I think I want to become you know, a nurse, and she did. Nursing afforded her the opportunity to continue her path of providing humane treatment, education, and empowerment to others. She became a voice for those who could not speak for themselves. She educated herself and her family. She also now is one of the folks as a part of what we call the Cecil B. Moore Freedom Fighters. Now if I say Cecil B. Moore, we may know the street, but do we know about the man? So I have a handout for you with respect to that. Because for many of the things that are occurring right now, of which Karen is still a part, all right, we, we wish for Cecil B. We wish for that, that gruff voice. I don't know if I wish for the cigar. <laughs> <laughs> Different, different, different mentality. mentality today. It's hard. It's hard. It seems it challenging. Seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the kind of that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So, so I'm ready. I'm ready for this challenge, and I was built for this. I think that we all have a purpose in life, and mine is going to take on a task that most that most of back away from, from. Impossible. that impossible, so people, people say it's impossible, I see possibilities, possibilities. I, don't see I don't see anything, anything as being impossible. Being impossible. Mentalities, 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 there are different, there are different mentalities, mentalities, but just like, just like there's, there's different, different ways to teach people how to do there's, there's different ways to